Well, let's start. Uh, good morning and good afternoon to everyone. This is the second webinar that L2B is hosting. Uh, the first one was in Europe. Uh, this is focused in Latin America and, uh, and the Caribbean. It's about the commercial aviation in mar uh, market in Latin America. Uh, firstly, I would like to thank and introduce L2B. Uh, thank you for in inviting me to moderate this panel, uh, this webinar, and introduce L2B for those who, uh, who don't know. Uh, as a brief introduction of L2B, uh, is the world's aviation premier, premier network of independent aviation law firms over 45 law firms in the world uh, with more than 820 partners. Uh, of those lawyers, uh, more than 100 are specialized in aviation. Uh, this year, we were supposed to say, we are celebrating uh, the 20 years of, the, of, of, the, of this network. We were supposed to celebrate in another way, but we are celebrating this at home and with you as, as our audience. Um, today, I have an excellent roster of speakers to join me. Um, not only speakers, but very good friends, mostly. Uh, uh, basically, very good friends. This is a, like a family in a certain way, then to be. Well, we have Maria Lourdes Marengo. She's a, a partner of a Panamanian law firm uh, Patton Moreno and Asbat, and uh, she is in charge of the corporate and finance department, uh, specializing in aviation and commercial law. We also have Alina Nazar. Uh, she's a partner at Central American law firm Nazar Abogados. She leads the firm's aviation practice. Uh, she has advised uh, uh, clients on aircraft financing transactions and also airlines in regulatory filings. Uh, she is the former president and currently member of the board of directors of the International Aviation Women Association, IAWA. Uh, we have Ken Bash. Uh, Ken Bash is the one responsible for bringing me to L2B. Thank you, Ken. Uh, he's the founder of Brazilian law firm Bash and Rame. He concentrates on corporate matters, corporate finance, and asset-based finance in particular and in particular aircraft. Uh, he has represented uh, numerous banks, leasing companies, manufacturers, and export credit agencies in the financing of business aircraft and helicopters. We have also Jose Elias Del Hierro, uh, founder at, uh, founding partner of uh, Del Hierro Abogados in Colombia. He is a speaker at several conferences uh, specialized in aviation. Uh, he's a member of the Latin American Association of Airspace and Law and the Colombian As Association of Aviation Law. And last but not least, we have Juan Carlos Machorro. He is the partner of a, a Mexican a law firm Santa Marina Steta. His practice is focused in general corporate and finance matters with special emphasis on aviation and airport matters. And for those who don't know me, I am Gonzalo Yelpo. I am a partner at the Uruguayan law firm, uh, Yelpo and Facara Abogados. And I am also legal director uh, of ALTA, the Latin American Air Transport Association. So the scope of this webinar is to talk about the impact of COVID in the Latin American aviation market. Uh, so just a couple of minute, uh, minutes to set the scene. Uh, and uh, please, as a housekeeping aspect, uh, remember the Q&A section is the, where you can pose your questions to the speakers. And I will be happy to, to, to make them. Um, well, as a set of the scene, the, as you, many people uh, in the audience already know the aviation contributes through its uh, uh, extended uh, benefits with 8% of the GDP of the region as uh, the WTTC states in, the, in, their, in their reports. Um, 
and it has been very uh, hit very hard. Uh, we can see that uh, according to the numbers of Alta, in April to 2020, uh, compared with April uh, 2019, traffic went down 97%. Load factors went down 23.7%. Uh, this was due to the borders closed to the limitation of flights with little exceptions such as humanitarian flights or other exceptions like in Brazil uh, with that has a the ability to make domestic flights and international flights, the case of Mexico and in Chile that certain flights are, are allowed as well. Uh, we, the industry never expected a, a, an impact like this one. Uh, remember to be a, a, in industry meetings in February and we were expecting impacts. Uh, we were comparing the impact in the industry similar to the SARS, the MERS, the H1N1, but no one, no one expected something like this. No one imagined that the whole industry would be stopped, the aircraft parked in the, in the airports. Uh, this meant that the, from a, a day to another, the airlines faced the situation that no income, they received no income at all. However, their costs remained fixed in a 50% at least. And then the government stepped in in the case of the US with a 52 million package, billion package in the CARES Act. Uh, we saw also in media, the, in the case of Germany, assisting uh, Lufthansa with the 9 billion euros, or France stepping in with uh, 7 billion euros. In Latin America, the situation is totally different. The governments have other priorities and has and have less uh, cash to spend in, in, in this industry. So the only one that is considering certain loans is Brazil, but in a very small amount compared to those that I just mentioned. And there is no perspective of receiving loans or, go, or government warranties or whatever. So there is very limited support. This led to certain uh, to the biggest uh, airline in the Latin American airline and the oldest one as well. Uh, the two of them uh, filed for uh, court protection under chapter 11 in the US. And this brings the, the first question that I will start with Ken Bash, who has lots of experience in this area. Uh, Ken, uh, where are we now with the bankruptcy filings and the impact of Chapter 11 and the bankruptcy laws, in the local laws, in the negotiation of leases and other type of creditors? Thank you, Gonzalo. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, we have very limited time, so I will get straight into the topic. Uh, virtually all leases throughout uh, the region and perhaps throughout the world are being renegotiated now. Um, airlines have been hit in an unprecedented way. Um, there's a possible exception with cargo aircraft, but otherwise virtually all leases are being uh, renegotiated. In, um, in Latin America, the airlines tend to rely disproportionately on leases. In Brazil, for instance, I would say it's close to 100%, if not 100% of the fleets are leased. So all of the leases are now uh, in renegotiation. Um, there's a combination of rent deferrals, which is the most uh, common way of dealing with the uh, current crisis, sometimes some rent de de uh, reductions and occasionally some changes to the length of uh, lease terms. Um, if an airline is unable to uh, renegotiate enough of its leases fast enough, uh, then they have to go to uh, some sort of bankruptcy restructuring. And what we have seen, as you've mentioned, are two major airlines in the region, uh, LATAM from Chile, but it's uh, misleading to say it's only from Chile because uh, LATAM's Brazilian branch is one of the major airlines here um, and they also have operating companies in several other jurisdictions in the region. So, um, and Avianca from Colombia. So uh, these two have sought uh, chapter 11 protection in the United States. They did not file under their local um, laws. Uh, what we see here in Brazil is a lot of uncertainty as to whether the other two major carriers, which are Azul and Gol, 
might follow in their steps and follow chapter 11, or if they might follow a uh, file for uh, bankruptcy restructuring in Brazil under a procedure called judicial recuperation. Uh, there are several differences between chapter 11 and local laws. I'm going to deal with some of the differences between the Brazilian law and chapter 11, and I'll do them very uh, quickly uh, so that everyone has an opportunity to speak. Um, in Brazil, chapter 11 type uh, uh, protection is called judicial recuperation. We have had, um, since the law became effective, seven uh, airlines uh, seek chapter or judicial recuperation. Six no longer exist. One still exists, although it's very small. So it has not been a very successful process. And the Brazilian law does not allow for the restructuring of leases. So uh, leases are, are, aircraft leases are excluded from the uh, entire process. So uh, a company, an airline that files in Brazil would not be able to restructure its leases. This is a reason to go for chapter 11. And this is probably one of the things that um, influenced the other two airlines that you mentioned. Uh, in chapter 11, there's a loss of equity um, uh, in almost all cases, which is not always the case in Brazil, but in any event, the value of equity falls very quickly. Uh, so um, there are advantages and disadvantages. Um, it's generally our view that um, chapter 11 is possible for Gol and, and, and uh, Zul, but we think it's less likely than uh, a local filing, or perhaps there would be a combination of filings. Now, some people have heard of chapter 15, and so for a moment, I'll just explain. Chapter 15 is a United States procedure that would not be the primary uh, insolvency reorganization procedure. It's a protective procedure. So if a Brazilian company uh, were to file for judicial recuperation in Brazil, they might also file Chapter 15 in the United States. That just means that a, a U.S. bankruptcy court would issue an order that protects the, um, the Brazilian procedure or the assets of that debtor in the United States while the procedure is being un, uh, administered. But the main proceeding would be uh, in uh, the local uh, jurisdiction. Um, this has all uh, generated a lot of discussion about something we call uh, PIJ, primary insolvency jurisdiction. It's also a Cape Town issue, this uh, concept, um, because both the Chilean and Colombian courts are being asked to recognize that New York is the primary insolvency jurisdiction for these airlines that are uh, based in their respective countries. Um, this could happen in Brazil. Um, it's, I, we believe it's less likely, but it could happen in Brazil. And uh, we will, well, time will tell. It will depend on whether the release negotiations uh, can be concluded uh, in time uh, to avoid this. But it is a very real risk. Um, and literally, there are rumors every day. Uh, this morning, I had three emails saying, oh, there's rumors about gold, rumors about Azul. They literally come up every day. So hopefully, uh, we'll have more clarity in the next uh, few weeks. Thank you, Ken. Um, this leads me to another question uh, to Jose Elias in this case. It's about if, if which would be the impact in the, of bankruptcy in the, in the uh, routes concessions and the operation of those routes. And you are based in one of the, on the home market of, of Avianca. So I would like to see, to, to hear from you on this. Okay, thank you. I appreciate this opportunity to share some ideas of what's happening in this lovely industry of the aviation. It basically, basically, to that question regarding the route, it's really, really important to know one point, uh, why chapter 11, why New York, and why the, 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 the airlines, the carriers that are going and filing this in this point. Basically, because chapter 11 uh, grants uh, a series of uh, protection measures to the, air, the, the airlines, to the debtors, to their assets, to their business. And that's why some, some airlines, we have the three biggest, Copa, Latam, and Avianca. And it's really interesting how each one of, 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 of those three uh, carriers are handling the COVID-19 uh, experience. Copa is not in chapter 11, as all we know, but Avianca and Latam, yes. And one of the points of the chapter 11 is to continue alive with the carrier. In this point, the carrier, they want to continue with their business, with the employees, paying uh, their, their obligations, uh, the commitments. And, when it's happen and what's happening with, uh, with, the, with the routes? 
basically, if we want to continue flying, we, we, we can continue flying without problems. In Colombia, it's very important that if you have your regular permit and you fly the routes, you could not suspend or modify the frequency of the route without a prior and express permit by the airline, by the uh, civil aviation authority. In this case, uh, one of the possibilities to modify or suspend the, the route is if we have a force majeure or a, an act of God. Is this an act of God? Of course, yes. And, and the airlines, they can, they can suspend not only because they won, they can suspend because the borders are closed. In the case of Colombia, uh, according to our local law, the domestic flights can begin on June uh, 30, 31, and the international flights, they can bring to Colombia international, international passengers from September 1st, 2020. Then it's important that the, 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 the routes, are not, we don't have any problems with the routes and with the chapter 11. If they want to fly, actually they can fly. They cannot fly because the the the, the local the local regulations uh, has prohibited to fly between Colombian points or uh, international points. Then the chapter eleven they don't have a serious uh, inconvenience as a chapter eleven measures to 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 fly the route or to do not do it. Thank you, Jose Elias. Um, let me share with you, since we are uh, evolving in this conversation, the questions that the, the uh, and the and the polls that we are having with the with the attendees. And uh, this is a very relevant one. Uh, the first question was: Are you or your clients currently involved in renegotiation of leases? Fifty percent said yes. It is going well, and both sites are eager to find a workable solution. It's interesting to have and to share this with you. Um, moving to the next one. Um, I mentioned in the introduction that the, go that the governments were making, uh, were stepping in in a certain way, helping the airlines in many jurisdictions. Uh, the, 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 the most noticeable one is uh, in, the, in the US. And this is a, something very relevant for the Latin American and Caribbean carriers, since the biggest competitors in these markets are the exactly the North American carriers towards the Latin American ones. So I would like to ask Juan Carlos and Mar uh, Marilu, uh, let's start with, with the ladies first. Uh, in, the, in the case of Panama, a very significant market, uh, what type of, of government support uh, to the airlines uh, on, in, in the infrastructure is uh, Panama considering for the airlines and, and for the industry? You are in mute, Marilu. Thank you, Gonzalo. And, and good morning, everybody. And thank you for the opportunity of sharing information on what's happening in Panama uh, in the aviation sector. Uh, the Panamanian government has not adopted any specific regulation to give support uh, to airlines, uh, local airlines and airlines operating in Panama. Uh, we are under a state of emergency since uh, March 14, and as of March 19, all aviation relate, commercial aviation related activities have been suspended by decree. Uh, indirectly, the government or the local airlines have been able to benefit uh, from labor law regulations, some tax law regulations, and an agreement between the banking sector and the government of Panama. On labor law regulations, Panama has adopted provisions uh, to the effect that uh, workers uh, for companies that, whose activity has been suspended uh, can, uh, are, are also suspended as the activities and therefore the employee does not have to pay. So airlines have been able to suspend a large, a very large number of employees uh, during the duration of the suspension of the aviation uh, activity. Uh, on the other hand, uh, not by government, but airlines have negotiated some uh, early retirement packages and some 
uh, uh, leave of absence, unpaid leave of absence packages. On the tax side, uh, Panama has not adopted any tax exemptions or tax incentives during the period of the pandemic, but um, there was in effect a tax moratorium uh, which has been extended until June 30th, uh, which is next week, and we'll see if that is extended further. And that grants an 85% uh, exemption on uh, interest and fines, uh, but not on principal and taxes. So, so that's also that could have happened. I also mentioned the uh, fact that the uh, government and the banking sector have negotiated an agreement. It hasn't become law, but the agreement uh, provides banks will give uh, deferrals on payment of capital uh, to uh, its clients. And to this effect, uh, airlines that have local financing uh, have, or I'm not sure if they have, uh, but because most of the finance is international, uh, but some of them have been able to get in uh, a deferral on payments, on capital, not on interest uh, from local financing. And, and that will apply more for, for domestic um, airlines than for international airlines. Uh, on infrastructure, uh, we have Tokumen who had just recently uh, inaugurated uh, the second terminal and had uh, obtained finance uh, from abroad. And the government has not granted any package, uh, but the administration of Tokumen has announced that they have obtained free authorization from, from cabinet to obtain a trade line extension in case that it's needed. So far, um, uh, the airport has been uh, receiving income only from, from cargo activities, which are not suspended. Uh, and uh, uh, the president of the board of directors of the airport just uh, declared last week that they are still being able to cover their operating expenses, but in case that they need them, they will uh, obtain a, a, a further uh, credit line. And I, uh, there are news that they have received offers from Citibank and Scotiabank also for this. So that's on, on infrastructure. Thank you, Gonzalo. Um, uh, I'm gonna talk a bit, a, a bit about uh, Mexico. Um, um, I think that to say that this is a, um, a deep and strong crisis in the uh, industry is a misstatement by all means. Um, this has brought for Mexico a dramatic drop in operation and income for Mexican airports and Mexican airlines running from 93 to 98 percent. This is by far the most dramatic crisis in the industry, in the history of the industry in Mexico. Um, also to limit the um, the effect of this to the renegotiation of lease agreements, I believe is a misstatement as well. There are leases being terminated, aircrafts being returned to lessors, purchase orders being canceled to aircraft manufacturers. I think that to focus only on the potential chapter 11 of this at the airline level is again a misstatement. This is a very transversal industry as we all know. Many of our countries do rest a lot of the economy in tourism. This is closely tied to tourism. So I do believe that we are just getting started in terms of having visibility of the problems and consequences of this pandemic crisis in our industry. As uh, Gonzalo um, clearly mentioned, in Europe and in, in the US, in between those two regions, there's a U.S. amount of 123 billion package for the airlines, either in the form of loans, loan guarantees, wage subsidies, or direct equity to the airlines, the European and the, the U.S. airlines. None of this is happening in LATAM, and certainly none of this is happening in Mexico. Um, basically, uh, airlines in Latin America are essentially on their own in this crisis. Either because, as Gonzalo mentions, governments do believe that it is a bad policy to pump money into the sector, or because governments are simply unable to afford such a support. 
The thing is that we are facing this situation in Mexico, which is no exception to this, with an administration that does not believe in pumping money in, in, in crisis times to private investment uh, sectors. Uh, there are no federal government uh, uh, support or taxes at all, even though, as you know, uh, Gonzalo, Alta, Ayata, Canaero have all approached the airlines themselves, the Mexican government. There seems to be no response and no support in the radar available for the coming future. What's the, what this means is that there are certain local taxes that are affording certain support, not only to the industry, but to other sectors. Certainly airport concession holders are getting some support in terms of credit and huge discounts for airport services for Mexican airlines. Um, and regarding airport infrastructure, uh, as in the case of uh, Panama, we had some projects in line, we had some projects in the pipeline, despite recommendations by international organizations in the industry of basically stopping those projects and focus more on supporting the industry, our Mexican government has decided to move forward with one of the iconic iconic infrastructure projects of uh, President Lopez Obrador, which is the airport in Santa Lucia. We may end up seeing a situation three or four years down the road where we will have basically two canceled projects. This is a personal opinion. The Scoco and Santa Lucia, both of them useless, bunch of money being spent irresponsibly. So that's where we stand. The, uh, the forecast is not an optimistic one, certainly. There are rumors of at least two uh, main carriers in Mexico going to chapter 11. These have been dismissed by these two companies, but the future and the actual consequences are, are yet to come and be seen. That's, that's a, a brief report, Gonzalo, on what is happening in Mexico besides the earthquake that we experienced yesterday that fortunately had no damages in Mexico City. Thank you, Juan Carlos. Um... On this side of the of the government aid or government support uh, at the industry, we, uh, especially at Alta, uh, we used as an example uh, the situation in Brazil, if which the the Brazilian government was the first one to step in with the tax and fees deferrals, uh, especially overflight fees and other type of fees, but also right now with the Benedese loans. So I, just in two minutes, can if you could briefly explain which are these type of loans and the measures that the government of Brazil already made? Yes, uh, very quickly. Yes. Um, so the, as soon as the crisis uh, took hold in, I would say in March, the BNDES, uh, the Brazilian National Development Bank for Economic and Social Support, um, it, which is a federal government bank, uh, it announced a program. Um, initially, uh, the program was going to be uh, for two billion reais for each of the three major carriers. That's LATAM, Goal, uh, LATAM Brazil, that is Goal and Azul. Um, the number has changed a lot over the, this time, and, the, and there have been many delays. The basic terms of the program are that it will be supported 60% uh, by the BNDES, 30% by Brazilian banks, and 10% through the Brazilian capital markets, all through the sh uh, sale of share warrants and perhaps debentures. There are a lot of details that have not been made public. Um, some of the problems with this uh, are that uh, the uncertainty of timing. Um, initially, we thought it would happen in April, then we thought it would happen in May, in June, and most recently, it, it, it is now announced that it will probably be concluded in July. Also, the uh, interest market, uh, rates are at market rates, which uh, are not, not subsidized. So this is um, the one large example of a Latin American country that has announced support, direct support, um, I will say somewhat similar to the US and European countries, but not anywhere it pales in comparison to those. Now, uh, one of our uh, attendees has asked, why did uh, LATAM uh, from Chile, uh, when it filed chapter 11, uh, not include LATAM Brazil uh, in its uh, filing? And the reason I mention that here is that the reason relates to the BNDES program. To remain eligible for the BNDES program, LATAM wanted to keep the Brazilian operating entity out of the Chapter 11 proceeding. So it is really mainly uh, for that reason. There are probably some other secondary reasons, but it's the main reason why uh, TAM or LATAM Brazil was not included in the Chapter 11 program. 
Thank you, Ken. You were very clear on this. Um, we also have seen, and uh, this is a message that we are uh, willing to convey to the governments, that at this point, the, the, the countries will be competing for the capacity that the LS can offer. So in a certain way, we, we're willing to, to them to realize that they are in a certain way competing among each of the countries to receive this capacity, this scarce capacity that the airlines will be able to provide in the future. So we have seen this example of Brazil trying to be helpful with the industry. Uh, Colombia was one of the ones that stepped ahead as well in a certain way uh, with the, these tax deferrals. So Jose Elias, if you could briefly explain what Colombia did. Well, thanks Gonzalo. Yes, I can, I can, I can say that the Colombian government, they do they, their, their best, not only for the airline industry, they try to do it to all the industries, but specific for the aviation industries, they, they took a lot of measures tending to, uh, to really relieve the tension created by, by the COVID to the industry. The first one was uh, in the case of the new charges related uh, to the airport's infrastructure are suspended during the health emergency. Those new charges like such as uh, landing fees and so on, only the new ones. During all the terms until the, uh, the end of the, uh, the health emergency that will be take place on August 31st, uh, 2020. The other one is it's really important. The civil aviation authorities suspend the collection of the leasing fees for all those spaces in the airport, in the airports managed directly by the civil aviation authorities, not for those airports that are under a concessionary agreement with, with the private. Then all those airports managed by the civil aviation, the airlines, and also the other lessors, they, 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 are, they don't have problems with those payments of the, of the leasing fees. Another point really interesting, uh, in the Colombian uh, runaway, we have an environment, an environmental uh, timetable to, to use it. Then those, those environmental type timetables restrictions uh, established uh, for, for the operations of the runaway, they are suspended. Then they can use without limitations uh, those runaways, especially in, in Bogota airport. Now, those are several points interesting regarding the industry, but in the point of view of the tax matters, uh, the government established that if some uh, people, individual or a company who invest more than $20 million, uh, that is classified as mega investment in the aviation industry, not only in the infrastructure, in the aviation industry, they have a very interesting uh, tax uh, treatment. For example, the rate of the income taxes will be lower than the, the, the usual. We are talking more or less 25, 27%. Then the other one is all those uh, investors who make this kind of mega investment in, in, in the aviation industry, they don't have to pay uh, the taxes for the dividends as well as no equity taxes that we have to pay here in Colombia. And the other two, the, the, the other two interesting uh, aids that the government gave to the, to the industry was number one, for the, for the uh, VAT tax, the value add tax, now for the Jet A1 uh, fuel, we have a 5% uh, tariff then it's lower, as well as they reduce the VAT tax from the ticket price also two to 5%. Then they are doing a lot of things trying to uh, be healthy to the industry. Thank you, Jose Elias. Um, on this part of the is, is government or state aids, uh, I would like to have uh, Alina Nassar to tell us about the, she has the capacity of, of bringing 
the whole Central America to our attention. So Alina, the floor is yours on this aspect. Thank you, Gonzalo, and uh, good morning and good afternoon to everyone attending this uh, webinar. Well, uh, we have different situations in, uh, in uh, Central America. Uh, different uh, jurisdictions or different governments have uh, addressed this crisis in different ways. Uh, we have, uh, for example, Nicaragua, which has not uh, basically closed operations and still uh, running on a normal basis, uh, their air airports and uh, basically all the businesses uh, there. From uh, the other, all the other countries in the region, Honduras, uh, Guatemala, El Salvador, and Costa Rica have uh, closed borders to international travel except for humanitarian um, uh, specific flights. Uh, the, the reaction has also been different from uh, every, every country in terms of how they support or intend to support the industry. We must understand the economical uh, situation of our governments, which is not necessarily uh, a situation in which they can afford uh, to put a huge amount of money on specific industries or sectors. So uh, there had been some tax cuts or tax uh, moratoriums implemented in some countries, such as Honduras, which, are, which apply generally for, the, um, for any business as well as some support from the government to avoid um, dismissals of employees. They, of course, one of the main uh, issues with the crisis is that many employees have lost their jobs or have been furloughed and are not receiving uh, remuneration at this point. Specifically in uh, Costa Rica, I think it has been one of the governments that have been more active in terms of trying to support uh, the aviation industry. Uh, of course, you must understand that our country relies a lot on tourism and the crisis just came during the high season of, uh, of, of tourism uh, visitation in Costa Rica. Uh, last year, we had 3 million uh, visitors uh, coming to the country in 2019. And uh, the, um, what we are seeing now, of course, is that the, um, there, there will be a considerable reduction of, of those visits for many reasons, of course, from the um, loss of uh, confidence uh, to, to fly again, which is going to be hopefully recovered at some point in the upcoming months, to the financial crisis that has hit everyone uh, worldwide. So the government has been um, trying to address this in terms of uh, reactivating uh, the demand for travel to Costa Rica. And the ICT, the Costa Rica Tourism Institute, has been um, or approved uh, moratoriums on the payment of the ICT taxes that are collected on the sale of uh, and the purchase of um, air tickets. Um, besides that, the government and the airport concessionaire have been working on, um, on providing moratoriums on certain services provided at the airport. Of course, is if, if there are no uh, flights other than uh, cargo or humanitarian flights, there is, uh, the operation has been, has been reduced. So these uh, concessions or discounts are um, applied to leases of uh, offices at the, of the airport terminal. They also apply to commercial leases, of course, uh, in the terminal. And this counts in the uh, fares that will be applied to uh, or collected from airlines once our operations are resumed. Of course, we would like to see as an industry, as an airline industry, we would like to see a um, stronger um, or, or a more robust package uh, of incentives uh, to put our uh, aircrafts in, in Costa Rica or in any destination. And as you will mention, there is a lot of competition as to where these air aircraft are going to fly and who's going to get the capacity and who's going to get the seats, which are, which are going to be uh, reduced. Uh, uh, we heard from Alta that the expectation is that we will be back in the region as Latin America to the figures that we had, or the traffic that we have in, in uh, 2019, uh, 2009, I'm sorry. So, and it's going to be um, three or four years, uh, 2025, until we uh, basically recover the levels that we'd had in, uh, in just last year in 2019. So uh, we, we're 
we're facing a slow recovery of the industry uh, with the uh, dilemma of how to try to speed it up with uh, very uh, few resources from the government and the need to bring those aircraft back in Costa Rica, not only for, uh, for uh, tourism, but for business travel as well. Uh, and it's the same for, for the region. So what we see and what we're worried about in, in, uh, in this area is um, the lack of incentives. I'm not, and I'm not saying that the governments are reluctant to, to give them, but of course, as I mentioned, there is a limitation uh, on the base of what they can afford. Uh, but we, we're hoping for a strong uh, recovery, hopefully not, uh, not very long in the, in the future. Thank you, Irina, for your introduction to Central America. Um, the other point, and I will continue with you, is on slots. Uh, right now, the, there is no problem with capacity. There is almost no flights. But we will see that in the near future, once the uh, traffic starts to move again, and there are several measures uh, in, in the front of, 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 the, of the sanitizing measures and the turnarounds, uh, 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 those aspects could, uh, in a certain way, trigger the congestion in, in, in many airports. How do you see that uh, happening in, in Central America where they are very busy airports? Well, um, let, let me say that not only the issues with uh, the, the new rules or the new protocols for sanitation of the aircrafts and, uh, and turnaround uh, issues, but also uh, the protocols that are being implemented or that will be implemented when the uh, airports um, reopen fully for international travel in terms of uh, how the health authorities locally want to handle those, um, those passengers that are coming to their country uh, to try to test or, or to make sure that they don't have or they are not bringing the virus back into 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 our country. So there will be at this point, as you very well mentioned, there is. I mean, we were going uh, we are going to very few frequencies. Uh, most of the air carriers are reducing their uh, number of flights per week. Uh, some of them are even. Um, reducing the number of routes that they are uh, flying into uh, Central America. And some of them um, are announcing that they will definitely not return uh, to specific uh, countries, as was the case with Delta and uh, Nicaragua. So when we face the sanitation issues and when we face uh, the local protocols that the authorities want to implement, uh, for passengers, incoming passengers uh, into, um, into the country, that's really an, an issue in terms of uh, slots. There is no specific regulations uh, as, they, as there, is, there are in other countries as to uh, slot assignment. So basically uh, the size of the market has allowed to coordinate that between the authorities, the airport and, and the airlines and uh, pretty much the airlines uh, so far have operated, and I'm talking about Costa Rica, the schedules that, that are more convenient for them in terms of connectivity and uh, connections in other countries as well. Uh, but we will have to, um, we foresee uh, some issues in this regard that will require the intervention of the, of the authorities and uh, the implementation of some regulations as to how slots will be assigned if, if we start having those uh, problems in terms of turnarounds and uh, the, um, the, uh, the implementation of uh, sanitation protocols the, the, from, from the airline with local protocols to receive uh, the passengers. And that's uh, something that we are looking forward to see how it's going to be resolved when, when the time comes. Yeah, that's a very good question, Alina. We'll see how it, how it works. Uh, Juan Carlos, I am moving on to you. As you yep. know, Mexico is the second largest market in the region, uh, accounting for more than 30% of the passengers, uh, of, the, of the traveling public. 
and we have seen a, a soap opera in the last uh, in the last years on the new airport of, uh, of Mexico City, then the closure of that project, the Santa Lucia Airport, then the Terminal Three, and apparently there are new changes, and we are seeing problems with we are foreseeing problems with slots. Uh, Mexico has a problem, or Mexico City has a problem of capacity. How do you think this is going to work in the near future with these new protocols and the uh, and this lack of infrastructure that the city is facing? Yeah, thank you, Gonzalo. Well, first of all, we need to recognize that to go back to normality, we're looking at 2024, 2025, at least. Not only because of um, health-related clearly related issues on the pandemic uh, crisis, but, but, but the passenger experience and the passenger fear to take an, an airplane. What has been proved during these times is that you can do home office, you can work from, from your own office instead of needing to fly or having a physical presence at a meeting. So that's yet to be seen. As you correctly mentioned, Mexico City Airport, the current one, is, a, is, is by decree of 2013 a saturated airport. So the issue of slots has been critical since then, and it has already announced, the Mexico City Airport, that the rules for the assignment of slots are suspended until further notice. We have an 80-20 rule whereby uh, the airlines need to honor uh, frequencies at least in 80% in order to maintain seniority over a slot. That's suspended for the time being. Just on Monday, officially the, uh, the uh, summer season began, which is normally, uh, along with the last period of winter, the most uh, crowded uh, uh, part of the year. It will end up in, in October the 24th. So with this suspension, Gonzalo, uh, what the, the airport is trying to do is not to punish airlines during the winter season for the lack of compliance with this 80-20 rule. So we, we, I, I guess we will see an indefinite suspension of this and an entire reconfiguration of the industry and more specifically the rules for assignment of slots. This is certainly an issue that will need to be revisited. And as you mentioned, on this ICAO protocol that is not, of course, non-binding, the Mexican government has not issued uh, a mandatory practice on this. We will start to see a lot of confusion in the industry. Just to give you a brief example, as you, as you properly mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, Gonzalo, Mexico did not close their airports. The airports continued to operate. Now we have a situation in the airport in the Tijuana that is being privately operated, where a local authority determined that the uh, safety measures required by health authorities in Mexico are not being observed. So you have a situation where in, in Tijuana, there, we have an operational airport where there are no bathrooms. The bathrooms are canceled, are suspended. So imagine the type of disaster that this will mean when you have a three federal local and municipal level authorities participating, each of one looking for their own uh, convenience or whatever. So th that's, a, I, I believe, a brief example of the, of the kind of situation. I think I lost Juan Carlos, the rest of the people. If Okay, I see the rest of you. Well, we lost Juan Carlos, no problem with that. Uh, sorry, sorry about he was, he was saying something very interesting, especially this brings up another question because the, I am thinking about the passenger experience. I can imagine the, 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 the passenger experience in which uh, they are prevented to use the bathrooms at the at an airport, but also they will face several complexities on board as well. Um, so this bring, got, brings up another whole aspect that is the passengers, uh, not because of the, of the will of the airlines, but, but, by, but by government decisions, 
they have faced cancellations, deferrals, and they have already, they have flights booked that they don't, don't know if they're going to be able to fly because the airlines also don't know if they are going to be able to offer their, their capacity to, to the passengers. So this leads up to the, the whole passenger situation uh, that is a very important one and who is also responsible because uh, I can imagine that if the, this was a government, this, this comes uh, because of government decisions, we, we can say that the, the, when we studied in the in in, in the law school, the the Fed de Prince, the, the 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 Prince Act, this is a typical case in which the the, the private uh, vendor is prevented to perform the business because of a government decision, and so that triggers certain type of responsibilities, and also uh, it could be a. a Similar to similar to force majeure, so I would go. I would, would like to hear from Jose Elias on this part on the what is experience in Colombia for the claims of for compensations for the reprogrammation of flights and uh, and the cancellations as well. Well, basically here in Colombia, in the last uh, two months. Uh, the government issued more or less than 170 decrees ruled everything. One of those everything regulations, they have uh, exactly this point. And in the case of all those flights that would be cancelled as, as a consequence of the pandemic of the COVID-19, the government established that the carriers, the passengers airlines, they can uh, reimburse the value of the ticket in cash if they want, but is the faculty of the airline to make the reimbursement with vouchers of their own services. For example, uh, an upgrade, for example, a meal, for example, uh, an, additional, an additional luggage, and so on. That is really interesting because uh, they, they they gave to the to the carriers the faculty to choose if they want to pay with cash or they want to pay uh, returning back to the credit card or if they want to pay with the voucher. And here in Bogota we have uh, several uh, claims with the passengers. For example, an European airline they applied the decision two six one and the decision two six one and the rules in the Euro in, in Europe they oblige to the carriers to return to make the reimbursement with money or returning back to the credit cards. And someone uh, 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 writes a claim here saying, I'm flying with this uh, European airline and I want to my reimbursement in cash, not in vouchers. Well, you are here in Colombia, you have to apply the Colombian law and the Colombian law established that the carriers, they can reimburse with, 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 uh, with a voucher. Then it's really, really interesting, of course, protecting the, the, the treasury of the airlines. Uh, in, in, in this time, they, they need a lot of them. But they also establish the possibility that the, the, the carrier go into a negotiation with the passengers, if they want, of course, uh, the, to endorse those vouchers to a third person or, a, or a, someone from the same family and so on then I, I, I think that these, these kind of decrees here in Colombia are really, really interesting for the airlines. Of course, for the passengers, it uh, could, be, could be not a, a, a fair issue. We handle a, a, a claim from a passenger with 85 years. He's going to, to, to fly with the last flight from his life, maybe. And the, 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 the carrier, the, the, the airline said, well, I, Here's your voucher. No, it's, uh, it's not possible for me to fly in the next time. I'm 85 years. I don't know, but I think that it's it's a really a really na uh, important uh, regulation that established only is going to be a, a valid this this decree until August 31, 2021. Then for the next year, until the next year, is going to to be possible to rebuild with voucher. Thank you, Jose Elias. Uh, well, we are hitting the time. Uh, we are 
almost uh, one o'clock here in Uruguay, but we are going to take some more minutes to address some of the questions. So we are receiving lots of questions and, and the people are still interested, interested uh, uh, connected to the, to the webinar. So in this similar side of the passengers and the cancellations and, our, uh, um, and rescheduling of flights, uh, Marilu, you are based on the home uh, market of one of the largest airlines and most profitable airlines in the region. So what, what have you seen on this part of the, of the industry side uh, so far? Thank you, Gonzalo. Uh, in, we have in Panama a full closure. Uh, domestic and international flights uh, are canceled. Uh, the latest regulations say that they will be reassumed on July 22nd. Uh, COPA has announced that it plans to resume operations on August 7th. Uh, so we're basically, we don't have any flights running at this time. What we have seen, uh, as opposed to what's happening in Colombia, as Jose Elias mentioned, is that in Panama, there has been no specific regulations regarding passenger rights. Uh, the Consumers Protection Authority uh, is uh, ruling is what will govern the situation uh, but in practice, what has happened is that not, not only COPA, but airlines have negotiated privately with passengers, as uh, in Colombia, uh, they have preferred to offer vouchers or, or deferrals or to eliminate uh, penalties. Uh, uh, so it's more of a private negotiation to this state, uh, more, more than government regulations looking to uh, protect either the passenger or the airline. And, and for me, this is something very interesting because, you know, uh, uh, what side will uh, this run to? Uh, either will, there will be a, a protection of the consumer or, uh, or the passengers or whether there will be so, some support to the industry is something that we will see uh, after we resume operations. Uh, hopefully that, that will happen next month. Uh, but no specific regulations, everything is being dealt uh, privately through negotiations between airlines and passengers. Thank you, Marilu. That seems a reasonable, reasonable approach. As, as Juan Carlos mentioned in his first intervention, this is a transversal problem. Everyone is, has been hit by, by, the, by the pandemic, uh, not only the airlines, we are not the only one, the, the airlines are not the only ones hit by this, the lessors, the MROs, airports, civilization authorities, and obviously passengers as well. It's a whole uh, crisis that hits everyone in, the same, in a similar manner. Um, still on the, on the passenger side, uh, and, and taking advantage of Alina's coverage of the whole Central America, Alina, I would like to understand which is your view on, the, on this aspect in the Central American market. Well, we have not yet, uh, thankfully, received a lot of claims uh, against uh, airlines uh, because there is a, um, I would say, the, an understanding of the um, unusual of this situation. I mean, the airports or the government has closed the airports for international travel uh, incoming or, or going out of uh, Costa Rica or other countries, except for, as I mentioned, Nicaragua. What we are seeing uh, in a specific jurisdiction in El Salvador is a, um, a request for information from the consumer agency that goes what uh, what would say we would say beyond um, the um, data protection uh, regulations. So um, we have received a request for information on the flights that had been canceled on the passengers that had been affected, which is not unusual, but with uh, some detailed information that uh, goes beyond uh, what we can provide to the authorities uh, based on data protection uh, regulations. Other than that, I cannot say that at this point we have, we have seen a huge um, uh, increase in claims. I think that the uh, passengers have been very uh, understanding of the situation and the airlines have also provided 
um, different solutions uh, for the passengers to either reschedule travel, uh, although at this time is, is uncertain when they will be able to uh, travel again uh, uh, since the airport is still closed, and or um, they have been able to exchange uh, the value of the ticket for vouchers or different solutions have been implemented. So although we have received uh, and we have seen some additional uh, claims, I cannot say that the numbers have uh, significantly incre increased as the passengers and the airlines have been uh, mostly um, negotiated um, the, the different remedies or the different solutions that they want to apply into um, the unfortunately canceled travel. Thank you, Alina. Um, well, we are already five minutes, five minutes late. Um, and I will, we, we could speak about this, the effects of the pandemic for hours. This could be a, an endless webinar. So since we don't have that time and, and the audience as well, I will have a round of final comments. Um, and the first one is, is will be with Juan Carlos. Uh, uh, we know that everyone is working uh, some from home. I am at my office. Uh, I don't know where are you, Juan Carlos? Is it because of the earthquake and a, a, a replica? <laughs> no, I just, I just stepped out because it's a sunny morning here in Mexico City. <laughs> Okay, a final remark. Uh, yes, well, this is, this is going to be certainly disruptive for the industry as for other industries. This is going to be quite challenging and we are certain and sure that there will be a deep reconfiguration of the industry. Gonzalo, we may end up seeing a lot of M&A work in the industry, a lot of, um, of restructuring work in the industry, a lot of work for lawyers, um, fortunately for us. Um, uh, but uh, a new reality has come from the industry. Mexico will not be the exception. And uh, I believe that in a four to five year period, we will be able to get back to the levels of, um, of operation and, uh, and activity that we saw last year. And, and thank you for your moderation, Gonzalo. Thank you for the invitation uh, from L2B. Thank you, and it was a very good remark. Certainly, we have the, the aircraft, we have the infrastructure, we have the human capital. Uh, probably we will see some change, some changes in, in ownership or new business coming up from uh, different mergers and who knows what is going to happen, but the, 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 the whole resources are over there. So let's continue with uh, Marilu, your final remarks, please. Thank you. Thank you for, for the discussions. It has been very interesting. Uh, as Juan Carlos was saying, uh, it, it's going to be a big challenge for everyone. I think for Panama, because of its position and its hub, uh, Panama will have to uh, be very careful not to lose competitivity and the government uh, should get more involved. I, I know they're very uh, busy right now with all the pandemic uh, regulations, which are over 150 to date, but I think that they should uh, have a lot of uh, interest in, in the airport because other airports in, in the region, uh, as was mentioned in Alina, and I think Jose Elias as well, are giving incentives or tax deferrals or exemptions on, on leases. and and that type of benefits, which uh, can make Panama lose competitivity despite of its position and um, the importance of its airline. So uh, we will see, I think we will have a clearer picture uh, probably next month uh, when we resume operations, uh, not only on the aviation industry, legal services just started this Monday. I'm, I'm here in the office today, uh, just starting. So we will have to see how this develops, but I think it's very important to have a governmental support. Uh, given that the economies in, in our countries are, are fragile, we should not expect to receive any cash uh, as in Europe, but I think there are many other ways of helping the industry. and. I am sure that uh, we are all aware of that and our governments are aware of, aware of that. 
So I hope uh, next time we meet, I will have more news on, on regulations to support the industry. Thank you, Marilu. Uh, one thing is for certain is that Panama will continue to be the, the connecting point for the trade and commerce in the, in the world. It has been for a century with the Panama Canal and with the Tocumen Airport. So that is, some things won't change at all. Alina, your final remarks, please. Well, I, I will take this uh, couple of minutes just to answer a question that I'm seeing from Santiago Echeverri, and he's asking us uh, what we think about the usage of technology via apps to reestablish uh, passengers' confidence for them to travel again. So I would say that that's definitely, it has been recommended by ICAO and, uh, and IATA, and uh, many governments are considering that. Uh, I think it's a, it's a very good source. Indeed, uh, in Costa Rica, the uh, health uh, ministry is asking all passengers incoming on um, humanitarian flights to uh, download an app and, um, and do some, um, provide some information to the minister on, uh, that, that they will need to try to track uh, passengers who may have symptoms. So I think that's a, that's a very good uh, way to reestablish confidence from the passenger side. I think that is not enough. I think that we should work, uh, this is a collective effort and, uh, and we need to work together the industry. Uh, we need to go to, to work with the government and different agencies, airports, concessionaires, everyone. So we can, uh, as countries, and I'm obviously speaking about Central America, as countries that rely a lot on tourism and with so very little connectivity. So we need, really need to um, work together on a plan to try to reestablish, uh, hopefully, the levels that we had in the past uh, couple of years. Thank you, Alina. Um, regarding the question, it was a very pertinent question. The, 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 the technology, the, 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 the process of incorporating technology in, in the whole process of, of, the, of the aviation and the, and the passenger experience is going to move forward and quicker than that it used. And it has come to, to stay. The biometrics, the, all the, 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 the web applications that, that, that allow no people- touch economy. Yeah, yeah, that, that is, is going to speed up, obviously. Continue with, with the Ken on, on Brazil and, the final, and your final remarks, given your experience in, in, in several aspects on, on, on the financing of, the, of this industry. Yes, thank you. So again, I'd like to thank you, Gonzalo, for leading this and L2B for this opportunity. Um, I've mentioned two uh, or uh, the more relevant issues right now, which are bankruptcy filings and the BNDES. Um, I want to, in my final remarks, uh, mention something else, which is, uh, has been alluded to uh, by Juan Carlos and others already, which is uh, potential consolidation takeovers. Um, we have seen in, in uh, Brazil a co-chair uh, between two of the three major carriers. Uh, co-chair was announced about 10 days ago between Azul and Latam. Uh, this is probably uh, not the first type of cooperative effort that we'll see, and I don't think that it is, will be limited to this uh, crisis period. I think it will continue onward. Uh, Brazil has not closed during this entire period. We have flights, uh, airports are open. Uh, there has been a tremendous reduction in flights because of the fall in demand, not so much because of any sort of legal mandated, uh, legally uh, man mandated um, closure. Uh, but uh, what the, the big thing that um, I think will be uh, very important to follow now is will the Latin American airlines be able uh, to survive uh, independently or will they um, eventually uh, have to either associate or be taken over subject to any uh, national ownership requirements, uh, will they be taken over by uh, foreign uh, airlines, some of which are receiving more uh, support from their governments and also might have more robust economies when uh, things turn around. So that's the next thing really to look at um, and to monitor. And I think we're in for some very interesting times in the next few years here in Latin America. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Very interesting. Uh, and uh, it's a good moment to, to reiterate that Brazil has uh, uh, modified the, the, the ownership and control issues in, in, the, in its regulations. So it's a, in a very timely manner, like 
they were foreseeing this type of problem. So those countries that remain with, with the limitations will face more problems to, for the uh, support of, the, of their allies. And finally, uh, Professor Jose de Elias, please, your final remarks. Well, thank you, Gonzalo, for the professor. <laughs> well, he, as we already saw, all the airlines, basically uh, the, the, the largest, Latam, Avianca, that we are mentioned that are under uh, bank, uh, bankruptcy. The point is, we are at the beginning. The beginning as how will the aviation industry will round, it will run in, in the new way to, to, to do the business. Uh, we already saw that according to the bankruptcy uh, uh, politics, the airlines, they want to continue alive in the industry and they want to continue making a reorganization because that's the, 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 the target of the chapter 11, reorganize the debtor to continue flying. Then we are going to see that all the airlines are going to, 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 to take not 300 uh, aircraft, maybe 200, and in the case of Avianca, not only 180 uh, aircraft, maybe 120, I don't know. We have to, we're in, we're in, a, in a very interesting historic economic situation to lead as the lawyers in the aviation industry to lead how to continue with this industry. We have to, to bear in mind a lot of crazy ideas because this is a crazy situation that we have to manage with the airlines, with the least companies, with the banks, with the suppliers, with all the industry, because no one knows exactly we are going to do what. We have to be resilient. That's the, 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 the key word that I heard everywhere. We have to, 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 ma to make our best effort and to be solid and to, and to work with solidarity between all the actors in the industry. Alone, we couldn't go anywhere. We have to help each other to continue with this industry, with mergers and acquisitions and restructuration and every kind of legal uh, structures, but we have to help each other in the industry, not only in the aviation, in all the industries all around the, the, the economics of our country. Then it's the best time that I can see to look for new opportunities to make a, re a, a restructuring of our practice also, of our industry, and to be with a lot of crazy ideas. Thanks, Gonzalo, to share, to permit to share these kind of crazy things. Thank you, Jose Elias, and your title of professor is very well deserved. Um, well, we have reached to an end. Uh, Certainly, we are facing the most challenging time for the industry, but also for everyone. Uh, this is something we didn't expect. It, come, it came to us without advice, without, without prior advice, uh, and it has affected everyone. You know, our neighbors and all the people, our families and the people, all the people we know. But we will go ahead together, as, as Jose Elias mentioned, with solidarity and understanding the needs of each other. Uh, right now we have 75 people connected, so I, will, uh, I want to thank them all for uh, staying at the, uh, till the end with us. And once you disconnect, you will receive a request to go ahead with a poll. We would like to hear from you, your feedback on this uh, seminar. And in case if it is a good one, we will do another one and certainly we can speak for hours about this. Thank you very much for joining and I hope to see you in a future webinar. And thank you L2B for organizing this. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.